Okay, I'll uh, try to be fast. So I, I will present uh, ECMWF to you because I think it's an international organization that is, is rather small compared to, to here. And then I will uh, explain a bit what we are doing and how it leads to our data sets and how we, it leads to uh, Elix Nebula here. So uh, ECMWF is a, an uh, international organization which has, was established in uh, 1975 with 19 member states and 15 cooperating states which are uh, listed here. We have, um, so it's not linked to the European Commission, it's a bit like ESA, it's, it's a geographical Europe. And we have extended to a few countries uh, beyond Europe. And we also have some uh, special relationship with uh, other international organization, and ESA is one of them, uh, so is WMO and J JRC. So, <laughs> What are we doing at TCMWF? We are running a forecasting model. And the way it's working is very similar to the presentation we had before. But uh, the, the difference here is that it's real time. This is something we do twice a day. We receive uh, observations from the, around the world. We run a data simulation, which provide initial condition. I will come back to that. And then we run the model. And that creates a forecast that we archive, and the forecast is fed back into the data simulation for the next cycle and so on. Uh, another way of presenting the, the same uh, principle here, so you have data coming in, the data simulation, and we run model. What I wanted to show you is that I, we actually have several models, not just uh, meteorology. We also have ocean waves. We have a, a ice model, a land surface model, and so on. And we create several sort of forecasts, a medium range forecast, a monthly forecast up to four weeks, and a seasonal forecast up to six months. So we get observation in real time from uh, all those uh, sources of data. So we have uh, uh, satellite data is the, is the main uh, source of uh, observation, but we have aircraft, ships, drifting buoys, and so on. Uh, just to show you the coverage of data we have, on the top here, these are um, observations from a, a little station you see on the side of the road on, in, in fields, and then you have uh, balloons, you have the commercial aircraft, you can, you can see the routes here of the aircraft, and then of course a lot of satellite observation. And the data simulation is to take the previous forecast, takes all these observations and make a a grid uh, of the state of the weather. That's the state as it is now, and then we, we run the forecast. This is extremely expensive in terms of uh, computer power. We have a very fine grid, 16 <coughs> kilometers now. We have actually two models, a, 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 an ensemble model I will, I will explain to you, and then we have a high-res model. It's global, 16 kilometers. You see the grid points over Italy here? And then we have 91 level in, in the atmosphere. Well, that is quite a large uh, grid. We also are responsible for a private network which connects uh, many countries in order to exchange all these observations. So I don't know if you can read, but we have a, a more uh, geographical. So we connect all those. Um, we actually don't build a network. We, are, we outsource that to a, a telecom company, but we manage this private network. And this, we exchange all the observations through this uh, uh, network. In order to create a forecast, we have already always been a, a center of, of uh, high performance computing. So in the 80s, we were using many crays. We had several generations of cray machines. In the 90s, it was more uh, Fujitsu. And nowadays, it's uh, IBM machines. Power 6 is the last one. And we are. Um, running a tender now, so next year we may have something else. So this is the uh, our computing uh, system now. We have uh, 16,000 cores and for 20 teraflop sustains, but that's on our code. That's not just on the a standard uh, uh, benchmark. It's quite uh, expensive into power uh, consumption, as you can see. And we use our machines, we have two clusters actually for resilience, and we use half of, uh, of the machine for research, the rest for operation. And 
our member states. We archive everything. Since we started, we have a, a large archive. It's the largest archive of meteorological data. We have 22 petabytes, roughly, and we add 23 terabytes every day. The archive is uh, accessible to registered users, but we also have many public data sets which are available, and that's the one I, I, I'm going to mention now. The last, uh, that's very important, this is uh, in order to see how well we are performing, we do scores, and these are the scores since the 80s, and our aim is that we uh, improve our forecast by one day per decade. So if you want, the, the top one was the, the, the quality of the forecast at, in three days ahead, and nowadays it's in the 97, 98%, so that's, that's the, the, the confidence we can have in the forecast. In the 80s, it was uh, more in the 85. The bottom, the bottom uh, curve is the south hemisphere and the top curve is the north hemisphere. As, I, as you can see nowadays, we don't have a difference between the two because of the satellite data. In the 90s, we only have conventional observation. With satellite data, we have now uh, nearly no difference between the two hemispheres. And just to tell you how we have improved this, that's uh, the cyclone here, this was <laughs> in the 80s. And as you go, you see that actually our grid is closer and closer to what we want to forecast. So there's 16 kilometers nowadays on the global. So what are the uses of, of this? Okay, we don't provide uh, data to uh, the general public. We give them to our member states, which then um, redistribute them. So it's mainly environment, as you can expect, that also public uh, protection and safety uh, emergencies, but also transport is a big uh, uh, user, and the energy is really something that has starting uh, recently. There, there is a lot of interest in, in the meteorology for wind farms and, and all sorts of, uh, even the nuclear plant is linked to the temperature, because if it's too hot, you cannot cool down the, 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 your nuclear plant and you have to, 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 to slow it down. So the, the, the meteorology affects, the weather affects the energy. So now I'm going to mention GEO and GEO WOW again, so I'm not going to repeat that. It's a EU-funded project, and we are, ECMWF, the weather partner. And um, the, the principle of GEO is to uh, help on the discovery, accessibility, and exploitability of the uh, data. And as part of this project, we've been contacted by Terra Due, and they uh, uh, introduced us to Elix Nebula. We did not know about it, so that's, that's really how we came to be here. And then, uh, in order to build this flagship, we have two core da GEOS data sets that we would like to contribute. First is the TIGI data set. I'm going to, to, to come to it, and the ERA data set. The first one is, we can do it in the context of GEOA. The, the second one will be certainly done in the context of a further EU-funded project. Now, a bit of um, uh, background on, on the TIGI. The, the, the nature of the atmosphere is cha chaotic. And if you s what we do, if you change uh, slightly an observation, you have this butterfly effect. Is that means you can have a completely different outcome to your forecast. And that limits us to a week ahead in, in a forecast. So what we do is that we use that f by uh, doing some perturbation in, in the initial condition and run 51 forecasts at SMWF. And you can see in the top, the forecast to 10 days quite, uh, the 50 forecast stays together. And therefore, we, it, the, the atmosphere, we have a very good confidence in the predictability of the weather. In the second case, you see that all the forecasts go all over the way. And then they for, they, that means simply that the weather are very difficult to forecast. Now, uh, this is just to give you an example. There was a, a storm in 87 in the UK. Uh, the, the storm is shown at the top, with, that's the truth. And the forecast was not that good. But between all the 50 forecasts, some of them did forecast the storm. So they, 
information was in the data. It was not just captured by, by the main forecast. So we are several, 10 sites around the world doing the same thing. So the, there is a, this project which is to collect all the uh, ensemble forecasts. We do run 50 forecasts, but the American also run 50 forecasts, the Japanese as well, and put them all together. So in the sink, central place, and we have roughly 250 forecasts uh, run at various places on the world. And that we call the TIGI data set. It's, not a, it's a near real-time data set. You cannot use it for, for forecasting. You can use it for um, research because it's way too slow to, to exchange all this data. But we have quite a lot of users, and it, they generate quite a lot of requests as well. So SOPEX is a program of the WMO, the World Major Meteorological Organization. And um, so that's why we have this uh, international co collaboration and is to, to, to promote the collaboration between operation and universities and also to help people understand how to combine all those uh, forecasts to calibrate or to, to create new products. A couple of uh, examples here, for example, it's very efficient for these are tropical cyclone track probabilities. So once you have um, 200 forecasts and uh, you can compute probabilities of track, so that was a, a tropical cyclone Ike. Uh, this is the sort of multimodal product you can do. And also, for example, in, in terms of uh, hydrological application, you have many models. This is coupled to a flood uh, model from uh, JRC and then uh, if you use the combined uh, models, you, you get a better uh, accuracy than, than the, the top was the truth and the bottom was the combine uh, of all the forecasts. So there is a lot of research going on here and it's a lot of data. Now, the second data set is what we call a reanalysis. I show you that we run, we take all the observation, we run out forecast and we become better and better uh, along the years. Uh, uh, in 30 years, we've been doing better and better. But that means that we cannot really compare the output of the forecast uh, 20, 30 years ago and to the forecast today. So what we are doing is called a reanalysis. We take all the observation for the last 30 years, and we rerun a modern forecast. And that gives you a very uniform data set. And uh, people at uh, uh, SMWF are starting a 20th century reanalysis, so they are going to create a 100-year data sets with observation from the beginning of the century to the end of the century to have a very consistent data set, the same model, the same science, and then this is the second data set I would, we would like to uh, provide through the, the cloud here. And because it's... Um, it manages the observation using the model. It can create the missing variables and also make sure that there are constraints because all, all the, the physical and dynamical constraints be between those variables. And then you can actually see if there are really a change in temperature. So that, that's, for example, uh, from the 80s to, to the t uh, 10s now, the, the, the increase in temperature uh, so I don't know exactly where it's, no, it's, sorry, and the global mean temperature here. And that is a result we can give. So this data set is very, it's also removed the, the errors in the change in the observing system. And it can also be used to, to see extreme events like that, for example. If we, in, in this case, you could compare the, the past with the, the, uh, the, the forecast and see that there is an extreme drought in, in Australia for this uh, particular uh, event here. So it's extremely popular data set, 10,000 registered users, and that's for the 40 year reanalysis. So we expect a lot more users for the 100 years reanalysis. We really have 5 million fields which are retrieved every day from our site plus the mirror sites and then we don't have any accounting. So it's extremely uh, popular and it's used for everything. For example, 
malaria uh, outbreaks and so on because it's linked to the, the moisture and the wind and so on. So it's, it's really a, a, it's a data set which is very valuable for other science to, to, to work on. And again, uh, the energy sector is quite keen in to use it. This data set is completely uh, available to everybody, I including commercial customers and they, the commercial users. The first one is limited to research and education, but this one is, is completely open. So now, the last slide is our motivation. First, I think the most important is that we need to understand what is cloud computing and what we can do, because we have been, for, for me, it's still too remote. And, and I want to understand the cost model, and I think that is something that I, we have heard many times today, so I think I'm not the only one. But once we, I have, we have a good grasp of the costing model, I think it will be a great tool for everything. And also for us, it's with the focus on very large data set. It's not too much on CPU, but more on data volumes, okay? And we see that now, uh, really, to improve access to those data sets, because now it's not very efficient. We have a couple of servers, we have lots of requests, so if we Really, we could promote the use of these data sets. That would be uh, amazing. The parallel aspect, uh, that this is something I can uh, anticipate. Uh, again, if they, these uh, terabytes or petabytes are distributed, people could use them in a parallel fashion. And, and last but not least is similar to the presentation um, given by UNESCO. If for users with a very limited bandwidth, they could actually uh, run their processing in the cloud. And you can see the cloud as a way to compress information, huh? not as in the gzip, but computing averages, computing uh, uh, standard deviation. So at the end, you, what you extract from the larger piece of, of data is, is the more condensed piece of information that then you can download. And that's... Uh, concludes my presentation second. Thank you, Baudouin. Mm -hmm. uh, very interesting uh, talk. With this data that you provide, you also provide tools? Do you have yes. open source tools? Yes, that could uh, I did not put that in the, in the presentation, but I did put that into the, the, the description of the flagship. That's the idea would be to provide the tools. We have all the tools to process the data. So uh, tools and data. Uh. Uh, I had a question also. Uh, mm -hmm. These data centers that you showed, the huge data centers that you have, do you use them all the time? I mean, uh, is it, are they used to the same level all the time or do you have peak times of getting all the data, processing it, and then for a time the demand goes down? No, no, it's, the, the access is, is worldwide actually. We have requests from the whole world, so it never stops. You have the, ch the Japanese first, Chinese, and so on, so it goes wrong. There is no time we can actually stop the service because we will affect, always affect somebody. What about the processing, not the request? No, uh, currently the way it's done is that the data set, we provide the data and the data set, the processing is done on the uh, user's own machine. And that's our problem because if they really want to do a, a important study, they have to download a lot of data. It could take weeks. So it's a, it's a real bottleneck. Now, if you want to retrieve uh, 100 years of temperature, it's several gigabytes that we have to fetch from tape. It can take several hours to actually extract from tape. It depends if, if the, 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 and so then send them to- It is quite possible that many people do the same thing on their own sites, basically. That's what you're saying. Uh, from experience, f from the, the raw data, yes, but they, they what they are looking at is usually different. They, they look at different region, uh, area on the globe. Okay. So, so they, they may, now they have, unfortunately have to download the global field and then they will look at just some place. So that's the sort of thing they could do in the cloud as well. I, I have a question. I understand you have, I'm sitting here. 
<laughs> so, so I understand you, you, have, you are dealing with big data sets. Um, do you have any, ex have you any previous experiences where you encourage the, your users to co-locate their computing power with your data? So, I mean, apart from cloud computing, this, this could be envisaged uh, or already before, so, so that you had some maybe existing capacities that, were, that, that eventually could be available to the users in order to work with the data locally yes. and, and pro process it locally. The answer is yes, but uh, I mean, our member states who actually found us have access to our machines, okay? But uh, what we are talking about here is to open uh, it to a much wider uh, the, the people who have ac access to our machines are the, the med services. So the UK Met Office, Meteo France, the Italian Met Service, they, they come and they do their processing. But by doing uh, that, we could offer it to a lot more, uh, even the private sector or, I mean, if it's uh, universities, there are lots of, uh, and, and especially people who are not in meteorology, uh, as I say, they these data sets are very useful for non metallurgists because they, they are a, a sort of a uh, boundary condition to their own studies. You know, for example, for, f for malaria, what you need is the wind and the, and the moisture and the, 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 the precipitation. But they, so they use this information as, as the source plus other information. So they are not metallurgists. It was very impressive to see how your uh, prediction capability has increased yeah. over the years. Eh? Unbelievable. So just out of curiosity, if, if you would reflect a bit on that, what has been the single uh, biggest step to improve that? Was, uh, it, that's, that's uh, was it the sensors or is it the algorithms or is it more like that you can process now just no, a completely okay. set uh, or, or uh, amount of data? It's the advent of uh, satellite observation. I mean, of course, it's to have a, a, bo a model which is growing more and more resolution and so on, but it's really having uh, a, a global view of what's happening. Uh, so, yes, and, and, and the number as well. We even uh, put in our simulation GPS uh, data. People don't know, but uh, GPS uh, beam is affected by the uh, amount of water uh, in in the atmosphere. Well, I mean, you may know, <laughs> okay. and that is useful already. Okay, so that that we put in the model uh, and it gives us information. So it's it's the, the volume of information we have we can put in that makes the model better and better, and uh, of course bigger machines, but <laughs> and better modeling. But yeah. so, I if the model is your data is in the cloud. And certainly, as you say, the Met Office is going to extract what they want back into their data centers. Mm -hmm. Would it then be that, as a smaller user, I would come to the cloud data and do compute in the cloud against the data? Yes. Okay, let's not confuse. We have a real-time uh, job because the metallurgy has a value in the future. Not in the past too much. I mean, so we send our data to the Met Office, to Meteo France all the day, but, and that is not going to change. Here we are talking about data sets which are useful for researcher, like uh, our climate change and so on. Right. And they are f fixed in time. They're, they're, it's 100 years, it's one petabyte, and you can do a lot of, of research. It, I mean, real time use of the cloud, I think this is science fiction for now. I think it, it will take, it will, it will arrive, it will be. But this is now back to SLAs. Okay, so okay. I'm, I'm a researcher, I come to the data yeah. set, I run algorithms that are proprietary, that I've yes. developed. Do I then have the right to benefit commercially from the output? Uh, the second data set, as far as I'm concerned, yes. Uh, I, I couldn't check, but it's, it, it has no uh, string attached, if you want. The first one, because it's not ours, it, we have data from Japan, from Australia, from Brazil. They, they put their own condition. The second one is 
is uh, the, the the reanalysis is freely available. You can you can do whatever you want to. I'm not advocating no, this, no, no, by no, the no. way, because I I believe in pure research <laughs> as well. But it occurs to me that if a researcher has a valuable algorithm, mm -hmm. runs it against your data, he might choose to leave that data in the cloud yes. for another researcher to use. Yes. And I then think again, the only propagating. thing we ask is, is for, um, you know, a, it's a, like a acknowledgement of the source of data. That's, uh, so if in publications or... Powered by. <laughs> Yep. Yeah, question from the back. I was just intrigued about the uh, requirement for the high performance aspect. Um, do you envisage uh, a migration away from the need for high performance computing and uh, one day it'll be more off the shelf, common cloud type power? Well, those machines that we have since the IBM, they are made of uh, general purpose hardware. I mean, extremely good quality and everything but it's since the time of the Fujitsu I think we don't have a, the, the the processes are power PCs and and the, I'm sure the next machine will be Linux based it's very likely or Intel based so they, they, they those supercomputers are, are, are built from community uh, now just to answer your question the American uh, metallurgical uh, service as for the first is the first one has outsources compute facility to to a vendor so we will we, we are all, all looking uh, into that is that a physical <laughs> to vendor see what, what will happen <laughs> no, no. The, um, the use case here you see that fitting um the, the you know a common cloud as opposed to a high performance machine no, for, for me, I mean, so far, it's more for data mining, what, really, what I say. So I don't anticipate a lot of uh, CPU cycle, but a lot of I.O. Thanks. Any other question? And I can answer a previous question on data formats. There was a question. Just to tell you, there is a the OGC, which is the Open Group. Graphical consortium will take care on, on trying to homogenize the all the data format for any uh, geolocated data. I don't know who asked the question, but that's uh, <laughs> so. So there is an effort here, and maybe this this community wants to follow that. But I'm sure many of you are, are aware of that as well. 